going to do a pre-install on this AX system. I have a buddy, Ryan, who doesn't have time to learn how to solder and all that, so I'm going to solder this up for him so that it'll drop into his stock SCX-102, kind of have the speed control and the motor in their normal locations. And we're going to walk through all the soldering. I'm going to do some basic bench testing of this system so that we can make sure everything works before it gets put into the vehicle and then hook up the Bluetooth through the app and sh talk about what all the features and cool stuff do there. So... All right, so there we have it, box contents. This, obviously, some stickers, a couple zip ties, uh, some shrink tubing, and some double side tape, and the best friend in the world, the instruction manual, who has the calibration and basic stuff like that. But in case you haven't seen this video, this is the guy that'll tell you how to do the calibration and make sure everything's working correctly. Um, as you can see, speed control comes, battery connector installed. It's pretty darn long. I like to shorten this up myself, so I'm gonna get this unsoldered and then we're going to get all this kind of positioned and everything like that plug everything into a radio and receiver and do the calibration hook up the bluetooth and all that so one thing that i get asked all the time when i solder is what kind of solder do i use how hot's my soldering iron and all that uh, the uh, solder that my favorite is is the 6040 rosin core solder and it's a i want to say it's, it's lead tin lead tin solder and the new style solder that you find on most things that are shipped internationally are lead free solder and all that really means is it's a better connection it's better for the earth but it's a little bit harder to solder with you need a slightly hotter iron and if that's not good enough some liquid flux or some flux paste will do a great job to help in the solder joints kind of be easier to work with or if you have to work with uh, lead free solder or high silver solder whatever it's called uh, using a little bit of flux goes a long way to making your job a lot easier. My local hobby shop still has leaded rosin core solder that is fantastic. So shout out to Jake's Performance Hobbies in Roner Park, California for having awesome solder. Uh, and then the iron, I usually use a, I think it's a two or three millimeter chisel tip. These are usually best for big wire stuff. And it's probably 800 to 900 degrees, give or take, which is 60, 70 watts on a brand new one. Maybe a little bit higher than that on some of the other stuff. Stuff. So, uh, let's get to For it. For the most part, I mean, on most scalar installs, you probably don't have to trim these wires down very much and leaving them uh, full length is all right. If you want to get uh, nice and tight with less wires and stuff like that, for sure, feel free to trim these down. They don't have to be equal length. It, it, it helps a little bit maybe, but overall it's okay to have them the right length so it looks nice and clean in there. I think for this, uh, this pre-wire, we're going to leave them pretty much the same length as they are stock uh, so that there's a lot of mo room to move the electronics around later and shift things around, move transmissions, sometimes in scalers folks like to get custom with it and move things around this way it won't have to get resoldered later on i do want to shorten this guy up for sure this is way longer than it probably needs to be for the install and excess power wires are unnecessary the battery is going to be pretty darn close to it and the battery wires are nice and long also so no need to have all this extra wire on there but let's get down to it the first thing that i like to do is uh, tin my solder posts and then sometimes when i'm using lead free solder i'll clip these off or strip restrip and tin these because it's just a little bit shorter and then everything kind of matches it's a little easier to work with so with just a little bit of solder on each post now you see all that popping around there's that means your iron's a little bit too hot when you get solder balls popping it's it's kind of overdoing the temperature of the solder so one thing you can do is right before you get to work is just hit the tip of the iron in the sponge it'll cool it down just a little bit so that initially everything's not popping and fizzing like that but as you can see it's not ideal it leaves you with some solder balls everywhere so you're going to make sure that you keep track of that and make sure that nothing bad's happening there sometimes like that's not even a solder ball it's just like the the flux and stuff doing fun things uh, so those are pre-tin set that down let it cool off and then move on to the wires the important thing about stripping and tinning wires is to use a proper set of wire strippers so that you don't get a lot of flakes if you will or wire strands from stripping the wire 
that will, when you solder on it, what happens is those little wire strands will kind of pop out of there and they can touch posts and cause all sorts of problems. So you want to try to use, I always go one size bigger than what the wire is if I can, and when I strip it, I barely squeeze it, just kind of break the, the skin of the insulation, and that way everything's nice and tight, you don't have any loose strands there. Because successful soldering mostly starts with good stripping and tinning. You can tell if you did a bad job because you'll do this and you'll end up with a bunch of wire strands and things like that on your workbench. So keep an eye out for those. That will lead to lots of problems later on for your installs. And then to tin these, I like to do them kind of on their side like this so that the, wire, the solder doesn't want to run into the wire very far. Overall, solder is not a good conductor. It's just used to hold the wires in place. So you want enough solder, but you don't want excessive amounts of solder. And gravity will do the same things that it does to solder to everything else and pull it downward. So if you can just add the solder to the wire with, the, with it not soaking it up, if you will, that works great. And then sideways wire, even leaning down a little bit, seems to work pretty good. And I'm just making sure that I got a nice, even kind of like skin of solder on each of these. You want to have so that you can have solder everywhere, but not like an excessive amount of it. So that you can still kind of see the outline of the wires in there. And it's not all blobbed on all over the place. And that you cover all the, the strands of wire. Run the wire the same direction as the sensor wire. Yeah, it's going to go this way and most importantly with any censored system whether it's the axe or otherwise you want to do a a b b c c there's no two ways about it if it's a censored system it has to be that way so this is going to go right like that this order here is the same as this so i can just go one by one See, this is a little bit too long, so I'm going to trim that guy down just to fuzz. And then right before I start to tack something up, I usually like to add just a little bit of solder to it. And then away we go. I'm going to turn my iron down just a touch because that's pretty solder pop it. So that is A on A. B is the next one. That one's pretty much the right length. Touch of solder. And then you do, it's just a little bit of pressure downward, not too much. You don't want to like squash the wire down and mash it all up. So that's B and this is C and C. So it's just A, B, C, A, B, C, stand real nice. And this one is just about the right length. Maybe see, and then give those a nice close inspection. Make sure that your solder flows uniform to all the edges. It's nice and smooth. I got mine. That's a pretty good solder joint, if I do say so myself. You can run, you know, a little more solder than that, so it's covering, much like the, the battery sides are, but that's pretty solid. All right, and then next thing I want to do is remove these and shorten those up. Now, as hot as this iron has been, I'm going to guess that all I'm going to need to do is use some of my regular solder, Hit this guy like this, and then be able to pull these off. And voila. So when that happens, like I'm going to town here, nothing's happening. Just add a little bit of solder to the tip of the iron. And that will get everything flowing about like that. And then you just rest, kind of move it around. Solder starts to flow. Give the wire a little. That's it. 
So move these off to the side and uh, get these to the length I want. Now, I usually do these about in half, so give or take right about there. Should be still way more than enough battery lead for the way the rig's set up. Because the battery packs themselves have pretty long wires on them. Now there, right there, I don't know if you could see it or not, but there was a strand of wire that I thought I broke loose, but maybe not. And then, so these are a little stripped too long, obviously, as you can see there. So like this, see how they go up? And if I tin that, the wires, the solder's gonna all run down there. So I'm gonna flip these over like that so that the wires are flat and the tinning won't, or the solder won't wick into the wire as I'm tinning it. There we go. Words are hard. And then give that a little roll, give that a little roll, and then excess solder off. So over here, there's a solder station that has a wet sponge for wiping the tip of the iron off. It gets all the excess solder off the tip of the sponge and it keeps the things pretty clean. A little extra solder there. And then this guy, we're gonna try to mount it kinda angled upward just a little bit. And part of this, I'm gonna remove some of this excess solder and geez, make sure I get that cleaned up. And then hold this upside down. Like this is the easy way. If you don't have solder wick or a solder sucker, this is the Charlie trick of gravity is your friend. You hold it upside down, get everything flowing. And the excess solder kind of comes out. You can just kind of scoop it out with the tip of your iron until you get most of it out of there. doesn't have to get all of it out but you want to try to get a good amount of it out and you see I'm working pretty quick here so that I have the iron away from the surface probably as long as I have it on the surface to keep everything cooling off not building up heat brush all this off and so you see the difference there this one's got most of the solder gone that one's still full so do that again it's even easier if you have solder wick because then you can just put the solder wick on there or a solder sucker and just pull the excess solder out. So it seems weird to add solder to take solder out, but it, what it's doing is it's kind of getting everything flowing a little bit here and then hold it upside down. The old trick used to be you could tap this. So if you have like a block of wood, this is a little risky, but if you're in a hurry, these are great. You give it a, and all the solder comes out like that. And then you have almost an empty solder pocket. Not the recommended way to do it, but it works to save time. All right, so got that. And then these guys, it's gonna sit in the vehicle like this. We're gonna try to angle these up. This is the negative, this is the positive. It does matter because you, this, even though the axe has reverse voltage protection, uh, it won't work if you hook it up backwards. So you still have to have it hooked up correctly. It just doesn't get damaged if you hook it up backwards. And then these guys are actually right about the right length. All right, so before I start, I'm gonna kind of retin this a little bit. So that I get some fresh hot solder in there doing its magic. And then I'd like this to angle up instead of straight out. So I'm going to try to put it in there, hold it, and angle it just like that. There we go. That way the wire is just kind of pointed up instead of straight out because all this, when it sits in the car, kind of goes like that. And then positive side. Give these a nice inspection. Again, just making sure everything's uniform. You don't have like what they call a cold solder joint, which is, I've always laughed, because it's hard to see. Like you have a cold solder joint, you never even know, but these all look pretty good. And this is not a cold iron. 
So wire lengths are all pretty much the same there, these guys. The sensor wire has arrows on it. If you don't line these guys up and you plug it in, you're gonna bend pins and break them. So be very careful, it's keyed. And then the pins, it's not just that they won't fit, they don't really line up quite right. So make sure that you get your arrows lined up. Slide that in, and then that'll almost touch the threads. And then you tighten that guy down and you have yourself a waterproof system. So there we have it. That guy is soldered up, ready to install into a vehicle. We are gonna do some bench testing, hook this up to a regular radio and receiver, do some calibration, hook up the Bluetooth, and look at all that. Many times people take these, they install them, they hook them up, they turn them on, things seem to work, and they drive it around, and then they notice there's something wrong and they wonder why. It's because the calibration hasn't been done. The calibration is a very important part of the process, and if you don't do it, the speed control is never gonna work right. The Speed control harness itself is marked. It's all black wires, so it makes it a little confusing when you plug it in, but it looks super cool. But the harness end is marked. There's a plus, a minus, and an S on there. So the minus sign would be the black wire normally, and that always goes to the outside edge. And speed controls plug into the throttle channel on the receiver. Sometimes folks plug them into the battery slot because the battery's hooked in, but this is the throttle channel. And if that doesn't say that, it's number two. And uh, some speed controls actually have two channel number one, so look out for that. This one doesn't, it's just got a throttle channel. This receiver has already been bound to my radio, so I know that these two are working, the light stays on solid, all that fun stuff. I'm plugged in correctly there. I have a charged three cell battery pack. Plug that in, and then we get ready to do the calibration process. It's very straightforward. There's two buttons here on the, the switch, the little tiny guy, and then the main power button for turning the speed control on and off. You hold down the set button, you turn on the power, it'll start to blink and here, we'll, we'll just show you. So that starts to happen. Then you let go, it's beeping like that. Oh. And you have to tap the button, go to full throttle, tap the button, and then go to full reverse and tap the button. And that's all there is to the calibration. And at this stage, the motor should operate, and it does. The other topic is that after you do the calibration, the speed controls in the default settings, those are listed in the manual, or you can hook up the Bluetooth. But the motor, after you do the calibration, if you've done it correctly, will spin counterclockwise. So that's a good way to know if you've done this correctly. And then forward will be, and reverse will be a little bit slower. because the default settings have the reverse turned on a little bit slower. So that's basic calibration. Going to walk through using the Axe built-in Bluetooth with the HW Link Wi-Fi app, which isn't super intuitive, but the HW Link app came out before Bluetooth was an option, and now the Axe has Bluetooth built in, so you can use the same app. It's fantastic, everything's built into the speed control. If you do have any connection problems because you've used your Wi-Fi link on something else, uh, you can go into the settings and change it to Bluetooth and everything will work okay here. So it's very straightforward on using. You don't have to do any pre-connections or anything like that. Just have this, the speed control set up. This is faux, like it was installed in a vehicle. This can also be done with it disconnected from the receiver. The important thing is, is that before you bother doing all these settings, do the calibration of your radio system first. So first part, uh, basically, um, it's real simple. Turn on the speed control first, and then uh, open up the app. And the, if you don't have your Bluetooth on, the app will ask you to turn your Bluetooth on and you can do that right in there. I made sure that I was turned on ahead of time. Little notification that's just kind of Hobby Wings app's way of saying that we're opening up. And then the next step, before you can really make any adjustments or do anything, you have to tap this grayed out little speed control icon over here. And that'll ask you um, when you're in this Bluetooth mode, which speed control you want to connect to. Default is HWBLE something or other, and or this is my GoPro. So I'm going to tap on the Hobby Wing one so it knows which one I want. And then it takes a moment to load the data, and then we can get in there and start making changes to the parameters. This particular speed control has already been set up for another radio, and it's been had some setting changes done to it to get it ready for an install. So it's not going to be on default settings, but you'll get the idea of what they all do nonetheless. So now that we got the dancing icons next to there, it's doing a little happy dance. We can jump in and start making some parameter changes by tapping on parameters. This one, uh, the profile defaults to crawler. We ch you can change the name in the next step. So you can. This is just in case you're going into change speed control. You want to keep track of which ones which. You can name the vehicle that it's in and stuff like that. I'll show you how to do that here at the bottom. But main thing that we're going to look at here and talk about is what each of these settings do and turn them up or down. What happens? 
Voltage cutoff is regarding the LiPo protection. So lower is more runtime, lower voltage. Higher is less runtime, more voltage. It starts out on medium, high, medium, low type of thing. Basic range is probably low is around 3.1, 3.2 per cell. Medium is probably closer to 3.4, 3.5 per cell. And high is you know more above 3.5 per cell. It's a rough range because it really depends on the loads and the connectors. Um, but that's the idea is that you can fine tune the LiPo protection for different plug conditions battery packs safety all that fun stuff now the next two are max forward force and max reverse force this is very much the max forward speed and max reverse speed so it starts out default at 100 for forward and it defaults the reverse to 50 that's why a lot of times the reverse is slower than the forward um, or sometimes people will tell me reverse is or forward is slower than reverse that's a good indication calibration hasn't been done and some other things need to happen but the default or for this guy, we're going to have it turned up a little bit, but that's what max forward force and max reverse force does. It turns the speed of forward and reverse down. Uh, turbo timing and turbo delay are related to a feature that the speed, con speed control can do that adds dynamic timing advance to the motor, and it basically gives it more RPM on top speed. So you can go from 0 to 10 degrees, and then there's a turbo delay also. The turbo timing is 0 to 10 degrees, then turbo delay is how long after full throttle before it kicks in. You can have it kick in immediately so that as soon as you get the full throttle, you're getting all the RPM that it has, or you can have it have a little bit of delay so you can kind of see it, feel it, or maybe when you get to a situation and you want to not be at max RPM for just a moment before it kicks in, that can happen. For the most part, this is just if you need a little extra top speed or more RPM on the top end. Uh, drag brake force is very much the power of the brakes at neutral and how strong they are. Your hill hold brake, your auto brake, if you will. So the more hold brake you need, the higher that can go. It defaults at 80, which is more than enough for everything. I typically turn mine down a little bit just, just because. Um, and then the next one is drag brake increase rate. Now, think about this like in a real car, how quickly you step on the brakes. When the speed control goes to give you the drag brake at neutral, it, it had, can change how fast that happens. Sometimes you want it for very low speed applications, you want to grab real quickly because it, it doesn't upset the vehicle. And for high speed, you want it a little lower. So depending on how the driving you're going to do most of the time, uh, you can change this drag brake increase rate. And the engineers came up with an auto mode that uses the rpm of the motor to determine how quickly it should grab the drag brakes which i think is fantastic so when you're going fast it grabs them slow when you're going slow it grabs them fast so it's it's very you know on the rocks intuitive uh, neutral range is the zone between throttle and reverse that is like the dead band if you will so the higher that is the more free play you have in your trigger when you move sometimes if you get a real you know kind of janky or wonky throttle or the the drag brakes feel maybe inconsistent or the car wants to roll forward and back on its own that neutral range can be increased to help that first thing you want to do is recalibrate it but if that doesn't work then you can change that neutral range uh, throttle increase rate is basically the punch control if you will how linear the brakes are, or I'm sorry, how, it's how linear the throttle is. Higher it is, the more it's linear. If you turn that all the way up to number nine, like we have it here, the throttle's very linear. And if you turn it down, it makes the throttle less linear, has a bit of kind of delay to the throttle feel so that it doesn't have that instantaneous response when you're working the throttle. So if the vehicle feels way too fast or too sensitive, you can turn that throttle increase rate down. BC voltage, pretty straightforward. That is the voltage output to the BC. You get uh, 6.0 or 7.4. And then the motor rotation. So if you give it throttle and your wheels turn backwards, this is where you fix that. You don't want to change the reverse on the radio. You want to change it in the actual speed control itself so that everything works like it's supposed to. For a lot of the crawlers that are out there, you need to go to clockwise. That's reverse rotation motor for uh, what used to be standard. Counterclockwise is normal forward, makes the wheels go forward or what is forward direction in motors. And this allows you to change that. And then the speed control is smart enough because with the FOC system to know that this is a 2300. You can go down here and pick different pictures for your profile and give it a name like we talked about before so that you can identify your speed control. If you don't want to change all the other settings and just quick and easy get in here and make sure that you know which speed control is which and which vehicle of your own line up you can do that real easy so that's pretty much all the settings and what they do and if you know the settings that are set on right now the 75 percent reverse the 60 percent drag brake drag brake increase rate set to auto 
throttle increase rate set to nine, and then motor rotation are pretty, my common setups for like TRX4, SCX102. Uh, I want to say that the Red Cat it also uses the reverse rotation transmission also. Pretty much all the crawlers do these days. But if that's what the vehicle needs, then these are the core settings that you're going to do, primarily being motor rotation. If you don't like the way the throttle feels, first thing you're going to want to change is throttle increase rate, smooth it out. You can raise that up or down. Um, and then the reverse force, some people like it fine at the default 50%, but most folks like to turn it up a little bit. Uh, but that's pretty much it. This will be like a simulation of changing the settings on the fly while you're driving on the rocks. So to make it a real simulation, my radio's on, battery pack's plugged in, normal receiver bound to the radio. Everything's been calibrated, you know, like this was in a vehicle. And right now, that's full throttle. I have that turned down in the settings ahead of time. And you hear the reverse is much faster. Full throttle, full reverse. So say you're giving your, your kid your vehicle to drive, you turn the throttle down for them. So you, they hand it back to you, you got the radio sitting next to you, you everything's turned on already, you've been driving, you're gonna jump into your app and then open, connect, and all that fun stuff. So first thing you do, open app, press on the speed control icon, and then it'll bring up your list of Bluetooth items that are in the area. HWBL is the one that's usually the speed control unless you changed it previously. If you haven't connected before and you need to do the password, it's 88888, eight, eight, eight. it's six basically. Uh, so that, when you're connected correctly, that's the icon that you're gonna get, the little dancing guys, and then you can go in and make some changes. So we're just gonna jump in here and right now, it still works. And you go into parameters, and that's the name of the profile. It's good to name your profile so that you can always tell which speed controls in which vehicle. And once it connects, we're going to just jump in and change the max forward speed back to 100 so it's really easy to hear it. Um, and then nothing happened. Hit save. It's going to tell you don't touch anything while we're doing this. So don't, don't touch anything while it's doing that. And once the save is successful, it's all right. Now let's see. No, not yet. You have to disconnect from the speed control before the settings are going to stick. So you can either back out, if you don't have a back button, you hit the profile, then you hit home, and then you disconnect here, hit disconnect there. And even if you don't close the app, it can still be open. It's back to full speed on forward. So on the rock swaps, no power on, no, no power off, just got to disconnect. 